Carolyn Handler Miller. So I'm going to be talking about something that's different from what everybody else has been talking about because it's not a product, it's not an app, it's an experience. And I'm calling it immersive narrative, which is storytelling in a physical space. And I'm going to focus on one particular example of something that I worked on recently. So what is immersive narrative? It's being inside a story, basically. The story is all around you. And you can play a part in the story. What is immersive narrative? It's an experience in which the story is all around you. You are inside the story, and you're interacting with it. And there are props, there are architectural features, um, there are things you can touch and pick up. So it isn't necessarily digital, though it can be very digital. Uh, there are different types of experiences within it. Uh, Janet Murray, and I know at least one person here knows Janet Murray, wrote about it in her book, Hamlet on the Holodeck, which is an excellent book about storytelling using digital technology. And <clears throat> she took the title from Star Trek, a, an, an episode in Star Trek. And uh, she called this kind of experience a hollow novel. And uh, it was a 3D simulation of a story. And you could do all kinds of things in the story. It seemed very, very real to this person who was playing the story or being a character in the story. They could drink tea, they could touch somebody, they could kiss somebody. Sometimes they would fall in love with a digital character. It was very realistic and very hard for these people to pull out of it when they had to go back to work on the Star, uh, Star Trek on the ship. Uh, so the ki kinds of immersive stories can include things like virtual reality and augmented reality, which I know Jesse is going to be talking about later tonight, and um, things like escape rooms, 4D dark rides, various kinds of theme park worlds like Harry Potter, the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, um, and mixed reality experiences. But what I'm going to be talking about specifically is immersive stories. And as I said earlier, they're not necessarily high tech. Uh, when I was about six years old, I created my own immersive story. We lived in a house that had a dry creek bed running along the side of it with high walls. And I'd go down into the creek bed and I imagined the whole world there that was populated by elves and fairies and gnomes and um, trolls all kinds of things and I couldn't wait to get out of bed in the morning to go play with these characters that I created although we couldn't really see them in my head they were very much alive and this is not necessarily a uh, new brand new form of story I think the Egyptians came up with it thousands of years ago when they built their temple complexes and their tombs um, this is a picture I took at Luxor, and the idea is that they used all kinds of media to embed you in a story. So they would use sculpture and hieroglyphics and uh, in paintings and um, architecture. And in Luxor, they would tell stories about kings. It, it was a a way of honoring their past, their history, and some of these uh, complexes also talk about battles and uh, the life of a pharaoh. So you were inside the story when you were in a temple complex like that. So the kind of thing in modern times that I fell in love with really is um, this kind of experience that you actually can walk around in and use technology in interesting ways. And the first time I saw this in the real world 
was created by an art complex, an art um, collective called the Owl. I don't know if anyone here has heard about the Owl yet. Yeah, I'm <laughs> New Mexico. New Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many things in New Mexico, you can say that too. So. <laughs> in New Mexico. So, Meow Wolf is an art complex, and in 2011, they built this full size ship, 70 feet long, very wide, and the ship supposedly had been sailing through intergalactic space and had landed in Santa Fe. And you could go into the ship and poke around. You could go anywhere in the ship. You could go into the uh, rooms, the cabins of the crew. You could go onto the flight deck or the, the deck of the ship. You could use the controls. Here's some pictures of what the ship looked like. So you could go into the cabins. Uh, they, they had crazy experiments going on in the ship. And sometimes people would enact characters from the crew. and. Uh, I love this thing. It looked like a dentist chair. I don't know what they're trying to do with it. <laughs> kind of spooky. Uh, they also had a, a full-scale wall that was a vegetable garden growing on the wall because uh, the crew was supposed to uh, be able to grow its own food. Anyway, it was a big hit in Santa Fe. It was a lot of fun, but uh, it was in an art gallery, and they had to tear it down after a while. And, they're trying to reconstruct it. I don't think they'll be able to. But I was totally hooked on this place. And then a few years ago, I heard that Meow Wolf was going to do another installation. And they were going to take over this old bowling alley that was falling apart. And they were going to create a story set inside of it. And inside the bowling alley was going to be a two-story Victorian house where some kind of cataclysm had occurred and the family had vanished and in the experience of vanishing and whatever happened in that cataclysmic event uh, they had broken through time and space so you when you exited the house you could experience broken time and space so time did not follow in chronological order and so it was a very ambitious product uh, and George R. R. Martin, who wrote, writes the Game of Thrones, he lives in Santa Fe, and he was fascinated by this concept. So he volunteered to buy the old bowling alley for us, and he became our landlord. And, uh, and so this experience was going to be called the House of Eternal Return. And when I heard about it, I just desperately wanted to be part of it. It sounded like the most fascinating kind of experience. And my background is as a writer, a storyteller. And I thought, how do you write a story set in a physical space, like an old Victorian house or uh, the multiverse, where you could go out and, and experience things that you can't in real life? And so I managed to get a, a meeting with the CEO, Vince. And uh, I showed him my book and told him my enthusiasm for the project. And he took me on. I became part of the collective. And I joined the narrative team. There were, the way the collective worked is you were broken into various teams. And so on the narrative team, we worked on the story itself. And there were about six of us on that team. The whole collective at this point <coughs> was about 120 people. Um, most of them were artists. They built things, and we had an architect. The most interesting person in the collective was a witch. She was a real witch, and she was our advisor because in the house of eternal return, one of the family members was also a witch. So I was very excited to meet her, and I started talking about Wiccan. She said, oh, no, I'm not a Wiccan. She was very insistent about that. I didn't know that there were different types of witches. So it was an education. <laughs> so what we did on the narrative team was we created the characters. This here is a picture of the core family, a father, mother, 
and two children. There was also a grandfather who lived in the house because his wife had passed away. And uh, she was also a character, although she, by the time the story takes place, she's no longer alive. But she actually was a witch, too. And uh, it was a, a linear uh, sort of heritage. So the, the young mother in the family was a witch. And the daughter was probably going to become one also. So um, the guy in the center, Lucius, he is the twin brother of the mother in the family. And Lucius has had a terrible experience as a child. And I don't want to spoil the story in case you go to the House of Eternal Return, but Lucius is kind of a wacky guy. And uh, he is kind of a sad guy, but he discovers some powers within him. And he leads people on, into journeys on various planets where they can find themselves. Supposedly every planet has some type of power that relates to you as a person. So these intergalactic travels were very important to Lucius. And he's also an author. So here's a picture of the house. Uh, when you come into the exhibit, uh, it's nighttime, so it's kind of dark, and the lights in the house are on. And we don't tell people what they're supposed to do. You don't know. You're not given an assignment. But most people who go there try to figure out what happened to the family, where they are now, what the events were that took place there. And <clears throat> then when you go out, into the space around the house, which is much bigger than the house itself. You see some things that relate to what you saw in the house itself. For instance, in the living room in the house, there's an aquarium with very colorful um, pieces of seaweed and fishes floating around. When you go outside the house, you find yourself actually inside an aquarium. So um, the aquarium has puffed up to a giant size. And there are clues inside the house about this cataclysmic event. For instance, there in the dining room, the ceiling is very warped and the chandelier has partially melted. So something weird has happened in that room. And above that room is the bathroom, the family bathroom. And you can see the floor is very warped. And if you look into the toilet bowl itself, you'll see a funny image. I won't tell you what it is. Barbara, have you been there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> OK. So did you look in the toilet bowl? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the pleasures. Uh, <laughs> well, that says a lot right there. Now. <laughs> so when you first come into the exhibit, um, as I say, it's very dark, but if you can't see well at all, you can find that there's a mailbox outside the house on the garden wall. And you can open the mailbox and take out all the mail and see what, what people have been getting in the mail. And um, you find there a bunch of condolence cards. So clearly someone in the house has passed away. And you also see a strange message from an organization called the Charter, which is now investigating the house. And um, they're letting visitors go into the house, but they're very uh, frightened about this family. And uh, they're sort of a repressive organization. And our docents in the exhibit wear white lab coats as if they're members of the Charter. So there's a bunch of charter members wandering around. And we have various clues <coughs> in props. Some of them are um, digital clues, like you can investigate the experiments and computer files of the people who had them in the house. For instance, the grandfather conducted a lot of experiments with sound. He used to work for Bell Labs. And so you can look at his various experiments on his files. And, 
And I don't know if I can show this. Oh, there it is. There. This is one of the props that I got to be in charge of. It doesn't really wave like that. <laughs> no. Like the bathroom? <laughs> this is a newspaper. And the story is set in Mendocino, California, which is a real town in Northern California, up near the Oregon border. And it's kind of a hippie town. There are a lot of people who grow marijuana in the area. So I was trying to think of stories that could actually take place in a town like Mendocino. So for instance, the bear there, I had a story about a bear breaking into someone's cabin while they weren't home. And there's stuff strewn all over the kitchen floor and the bear ate the steaks that they were going to have for dinner, for their anniversary dinner. Um, I also did a story about dog napping, which was a problem we actually were having in Santa Fe. We don't know where all the dogs went. Um, and bed bugs, because there are a lot of B&Bs, bed and breakfast in Mendocino, uh, and the worst thing that can happen to a B&B is that they're infested with bed bugs. But it turned out that they really were not bed bugs. There was just a bad case of poison oak that some people had gotten. So, but the big news was the story in the center about these strange lights in the sky that people were noticing and they were a clue to the story. And also on the right side, the big storm coming, which was not a normal storm at all. and nothing to do with global warming. It was just some kind of mystery uh, connected to the whole disappearance of the family. And it does have a sci-fi twist to it, as you probably can tell. Uh, so one of the most fun things and things that kids who go there particularly love are the portals to various uh, places outside of the house. So you could slide through the dryer in the laundry room and find yourself in a new environment. You can walk through the refrigerator and find yourself in a different place. And I'll show you what some of these places are. And you can crawl through the fireplace. So these are portals to other dimensions. And so if you walk through the refrigerator, you find yourself in a place called Portals Bermuda. And in the center there is a holographic kind of uh, travel agent who can direct you to other planets. And um, on this side here is a arrival departure board, like you find in an airport showing you what planets you can visit and when the, the ships were taking off to those planets. So all of this is connected to the character of Lucius, Uncle Lucius, who's this sort of sad guy. He's got some mental problems, uh, but he's become very famous for being able to take you to these other worlds. And that's his business card. So if you go through the fireplace, you find yourself in a cave. Um, and this cave was an actual cave that the father and the family had discovered <coughs> on the shoreline of Mendocino. But here it's, it's puffed up like the aquarium. And inside the cave are all these mastodon bones. And you can play the bones like a marimba. So they have these hammers a box of hammers by the entrance, and people play them. So that's what they're doing in this picture, playing the marimba. And there's another um, instrument you can play, which is a digital instrument. It's a laser harp. And there are no actual strings to the harp. They're just laser beams. And each beam has a different tone. So you can strike, mm -hmm. strike it, or I'll run your hands through it, and uh, multiple people can play it at the same time. It never goes out of tune. No, no, it's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> so everything about this experience is nonlinear. There's no particular path to take, and it is totally interactive. There are all these different things you can do. It's very much like a video game, uh, a, a sandbox type of video game. And so you can go up and down, in and out, 
you have total freedom to explore. Some of the passageways are extremely narrow and some are steep so only little children can do them. Some are, are nice for adults who might have some slight mobility issues like anyone can go through the refrigerator but uh, it's not as easy to slide through the dryer. Though I've done all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I love to tell the tale. Yes, I'm still alive. No, man. <laughs> so our primary audience, and I, I teach uh, immersive or emergent media at uh, UNM and at the community college in Santa Fe, and I always tell them, you have to think of the audience that you're creating for. Who is your audience? But in the House of Eternal Return, we broke that rule. We said this is for everybody. And uh, you'll find all kinds of people in there, uh, children, little children to very senior citizens. And I've taken older people through it, and I thought they would not like this at all. It's going to be too childish for them. But they really love it. They love being able to walk through the refrigerator. It's something <laughs> you can't do in everyday life. <laughs> Uh, so it, uh, it's a really interesting experience and the picture there that is the laser heart that people are playing so I'm going to be covering all these things a little promo for my next book fourth edition of digital storytelling uh, my publisher made flyers and I was happy to bring the flyers but the flyers are so full of typos and wrong information. I don't know. That was your editor call. That was awesome. I told him I could not distribute the flyers, but we did finish the cover. And I do love the cover for the new edition. It's you know, suggest virtual reality, which I'll be covering a lot. Virtual reality, augmented reality, things like immersive storytelling, and uh, mixed reality, and so on and so forth. Um, so working on this project was a real joy for me. And I love the people I work with there. It, but it had its problems, and um, I had within myself an inner critic, which probably we all do. So my inner critic has been making some uh, complaints to me about how we went around about developing this product. And so I'll tell you a couple of them. And some of this, uh, the way we developed it was inherited from the way the collective did the uh, ship, the due return. Because what they did for that was they assigned a writer to each piece of the ship a writer and an artist. So they would create a room together and uh, they were totally in charge of it and they were given freedom to do that. And so we inherited that way of working on this much bigger project. And so the artists were all given spaces which we call rooms and the writers would each develop a different character and would work exclusively on that character, which sounds like maybe an interesting idea because you could get very deeply into the character development, but the problem was there was no cohesion and you couldn't do a script where the different characters were talking to each other because they had no conception of how to do that. And I come from screenwriting and I found this pretty frustrating. Um, Though you should see the uh, kinds of documents that people produce, I mean, mile high documents of backgrounds, character backgrounds. Uh, well, when I came on board, uh, they'd already assigned the character, so I was most, mostly fleshing them out, fleshing out the backstory, but I got them to create a Bible for the whole experience, and which is what we do in television. And the Bible, uh, covered each of the characters, uh, what their backstory was in a pretty succinct way, and also what the basic story was, what had happened to the characters, why there was this kind of 
post-week event and what happened next. And the real truth is we don't know what really happens next. The family vanishes. We don't know if they are still alive in some other universe or if they just went up in smoke. But everyone wants to know what happens to them. So we don't tell people that we don't really know. <laughs> We don't want to disappoint them. But the Bible helped to some degree, so some of the artists would use the Bible to build um, things that relate to the story. For instance, the, the cave with the mastodon bones. That relates to what happened in the real life of this family. That the father found his cave, and he takes his little son into it. And the father is very interested in audio recordings. He records everything. So the making sounds with a bone would be something that would really appeal to him. So in that way, it did come out of our core material. But some things had nothing to do with the story whatsoever, like the laser heart. Uh, it's just a fun thing. And there's also a room full of old arcade games. And we painted up the arcade machines in beautiful colors. And people could go into that room and play the games for free. We didn't charge. People kept trying to stuff coins into them, but they, that part of them was not made uh, functional. So they couldn't really uh, pay for the machines. It was all free. So <clears throat> it was a different kind of um, model for making any money. Uh, <laughs> But it's been very, very successful. We've had over a million visitors. We have people coming from all over the world. It's gotten press all over the place. The first big article was in The Guardian. The New York Times has covered it. I don't think people here, except for Barbara, are really familiar with it, though. Um, but this, um, this kind of thing that Meowolf is doing, Meowolf is going to be doing and big installation in Denver, which I believe is three times the space of what we have in the old bowling alley. And they're doing one in Las Vegas, too. So I'm curious, for those of you who are here, um, do you think this is a new art form? Do you think that this is something that can be duplicated by other organizations? Um, and how do you develop something like this in the future. Any ideas, any thoughts? Yeah. I do think it's a, a new art form that's going to explode because you read all these articles about things millennials love, which are our first experiences, right? The ice cream museum, the color factory, all these things we want to go and experience more than just kind of see. We want to kind of go through it um, and have the interactive. This is super interesting because it puts kind of a narrative on it and kind of a purpose for going. I think what would drive me nuts is not knowing what happened to them. And I'm just wondering, you know, when you were writing the story, clearly nobody but your team sees that, right? Nobody gets the story in the end to read your no, narrative. They, so was it really more for the artist so that you could create appropriate props to fit into the story? Well, the story was the foundation of right. what, what we would make. Okay. Um, and there are like a sort of cheat sheets online so people have various people have tried to figure out the story but we do have some documents online that you, you can drive me nuts yeah <laughs> but we made all these different props let's see i think this one it's a cookbook that you can find in the kitchen and i had each of the characters of the uh the actors who were playing the characters write notes on the recipes so the recipes were personal to them and uh, here's one that the kids did, and they made drawings. Of the <coughs> so you learn a little bit about the characters by reading the cookbook. So there are various odds and ends left around the house that would clue you into what the story was. This is something I did for the children's room. A, a little book. The little girl loves animals and plants. So this is a book about her and her donkey. 
Uh, I, I think it is a, a new art form. I mean, I think that it's something we've seen in New York. Is that there's an installation called Sleep No More, oh, which true. is at the McKittrick Hotel, which is an interpret of the interpretation of Shakespeare's Scottish play. Uh, and you, you actually walk through all these different installations that have been done by different artists. Mm -hmm. So it, it, over the course of the over the course of the experience, you sort of get this very sort of expressionistic perception of the play. As, as it goes on, and it's wonderful. Haunted houses is really huge right now, and, and to what Emily was saying, millennials are, are buying experiences. They are not buying tours. Escape rooms. Escape rooms. And the ability yeah. That's right. to do this without having to go all the way to a theme park, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and be able to be a family outing. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what it costs to go to this, but it's, uh, I think it's eighteen dollars now. See, that's that's Cheaper great. Than uh, Pardon me? Cheaper than a movie. Well, Cheaper than a movie. Than a movie. <laughs> and a family can do it, and, and I think one of the things that that makes it for all ages is everybody brings into the story their own perception, so they are immediately storytellers themselves as they try to figure it out. And I just think that that sort of for, for families, you know, the idea of a family getting together afterwards and then saying, how did, you know, what was your perception? You know, I couldn't fit through the drawer. I wouldn't go through the drawer. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's just, I, th I think it's, I think it's a real experiential thing and it's story based, which is what's so important. And it's fun to see, you're right, because the whole family will get together afterwards and try to figure out what had happened. Everyone's going to have a little bit of a different interpretation. There's no right or wrong answer. There, we do know what the story is, but we don't really know what happened to the family after. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I mean, I know I went back to it twice, and we didn't get that story that far, so that's cool to know. Um, and it wasn't too frustrating because we didn't do it. Like you said, like you just go and you um, explore what you find. So you might not know that your story is wrong, especially if you don't go online and look at all the sheets. <laughs> and I feel like this is more successful than the escape rooms because those, those are really popular. And you're willing to pay like 20 to 80 bucks for one week, like most times all these at once. So this, like, you have to do multiple visits to get part of the story. Yeah. Um, we went twice a week, definitely. Yeah, people get addicted to it. They come back and come back and come back. So you can buy a, a year pass, but you know you can go as many times during the year as you want. You do have people doing that. Yeah. Uh, you know, some of this has been going on for a while. There's the mysteries that you can go to in the evenings and have. Oh, you know, you know about these immersive mysteries where you go in and you're part of the mystery. You're like in a house and somebody gets killed. Oh, I've heard. Yeah. Have to figure it out. And the other one was like Tony and Tony and Tony and Tina's wedding. Right, Tony and Tina's wedding. And when they were first, uh, Brenda Laurel used to talk about this when they were trying to first figure out immersive theater. They'd get people to come up on the stage, and then people would get up on the stage and they didn't know what to do because they didn't have a role. So with Tony and Tina's wedding, you're a guest at a wedding. Everybody knows how to be a guest at the wedding. And you pay and you go to the wedding, and they ask you what side of the wedding you're on, and all these fights break out. and. And it's it's quite fun. It's a, it's a quite a fun event. Bad meals and and, uh, and in fact in in, uh, in San Francisco, one of the nights that we went, uh, the one of the groomsmen was pretending to sell coke to some one of the other guys, and he got arrested by an undercover cop. And he and he wasn't selling coke, but that was his character. And they had to they, they took him down to the police station, and they you know, had to go bail him out. You know, That's hilarious. But it was a lot of fun to go in because you know what your your role is. Uh -huh. Yeah, this you don't really know. I mean, people are on the role of trying to figure out what happened. But they're, they're just someone who, when I was a kid, I used to love to go into abandoned houses and poke around, <laughs> look in the drawers and try to figure out <laughs> Imagine, yeah. what lived there. Yeah. Well, one other thing I want to add, I was, I was recently part of a, of a theater thing that was being developed actually to be used in a therapeutic situation where you, you actually go in and it's a sort of the beta test and you take on these characters and you're, you're challenged to do things that you draw on your own experience to tell this story. And, but you're playing a character, so it's, it's actually, um, you have to draw on your own experience even for some things that are darker. And it's, it's quite uh, powerful, actually, as you, you know, sort of re resolving this. And so they, this, this company in New York is actually developing this for use in, in therapy, and therapeutic kind of situations. So the story you tell, takes you maybe a little bit away from the exactly I do this, but I'm playing a character, but still access the emotion and that, and that in it. So I, I think this is a huge trend that we're going to see in the world. So I'd love to see more of this. So I, 
I hope it does um, grow new experiences for people. And I don't know exactly what they're doing in Denver because I'm not working with them anymore. But uh, I heard they're actually doing a theme park ride in conjunction with this installation. Well, thank you all. Thank you.